The following public affairs presentation is produced exclusively for the Cox Channel. And now, the verdict. Welcome to The Verdict, I'm Kent Myers, and once again this week we are very pleased to have as, as my co-host and, and your co-host, Robert McCampbell, the third show, third week in a row. I've been getting a lot of mail about how well you're doing, Robert. We want to get you back again. Well, I always enjoy doing it, and today we're going to hear from Pat McWiggin on direct democracy, and I think it's really going to be interesting. You know, usually laws get enacted because our elected representatives at the Capitol pass them. But what we're going to talk about today are those instances where the people vote themselves on what's going to happen. And there's some interesting issues out there, which Pat's going to be able to help us with. Yeah, we are very fortunate in Oklahoma on this particular subject to have access to Pat McGuigan, who really is one of the nation's leading experts in this area. So we'll be hearing from him in just a minute. You're watching The Verdict with uh, Robert McCampbell and Kent Myers. At Chesapeake Energy, here's a few of our favorite hornets. Alexis likes reading. Sam enjoys history. Alec loves math. Chesapeake is proud to support both the Oklahoma City NBA Hornets and the Young Hornets at Horace Mann Elementary, where over 150 Chesapeake employees mentor to children each week. The students gain a lot from the experience, but not as much as we do. Chesapeake Energy, committed to building a better Oklahoma. You need this one to get satellite HD, this one's your DVR, this one's for local channels, mm, this one's... What are we supposed to do with all this stuff? Got you covered. Oh, by the way, that old satellite stuff makes a great end table. That doesn't look so bad, right, honey? Don't live in satellite denial. Get the latest entertainment without the hassles. From Cox, your friend in the digital age. Slice of Cardinals Heaven can be found on the Cox Channel all season long. And welcome back to the verdict, Kent Myers and Robert McCampbell, and we're welcoming back to the verdict a guest that we have had a time or two before, Patrick McGuigan. Patrick is the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Labor. He's an Oklahoma City native. He's been act, had an active career in the political arena and in uh, particularly writing and both uh, books and articles and editorials. Been uh, quite uh, successful in that regard. In fact, he's an author of a book called The Politics of Direct Democracy, which is what we're talking about today, direct democracy. I want to just allude just for a second to one of the leading uh, uh, authors in this field and speakers in this field, a uh, Colorado College uh, professor named Thomas Cronin. I talked to Tom about this show and he said, the expert on it is in your area, he's Pat McGuigan. <laughs> and of course, I've known Pat for a number of years and I said, that's wonderful, we'll have him on and that's what brings uh, Pat here. Uh, he is, uh, has received many awards for writing and, and has been on television an awful lot. He was one of the original members of the American Political Science Association with expertise in direct democracy. A long introduction, but it's been a long time since you've been here. So Patrick, welcome back to The Verdict. I'm very glad to join you once again. Well, it's great to see you today, Patrick. And I'd like to start by talking about de 
direct democracy. And when we say that term, direct democracy, what are we talking about? Well, uh, I'm sketched out some notes so that I could cover everything, I hope, succinctly. Um, direct democracy simply means direct votes of the people on policy issues. And the form in which we're most familiar with direct democracy uh, is, of course, votes of the people on issues on ballots. Um, I use the term ballot measures because there's so many subsets. It's a yes-no vote of the people that decides a policy question. Direct democracy also, though, to be accurate, should include uh, the New England town hall meetings, for example, where the people still actually decide the policy question in a yes-no way, much like a city council would, except they're doing it in a meeting of all the citizens that are willing and able to show up. Um, judicial confirmation yes-no votes, which we have in Oklahoma for statewide uh, judges with statewide uh, jurisdiction, the Supreme Court and the two appeals courts, uh, could also be considered a form of direct democracy. And then finally, um, recall uh, petitions, uh, which result in a yes-no vote on whether someone should be retained in office. Uh, even grand jury petitions, uh, which uh, remain uh, a way that uh, a grand jury can be called in many states and communities. Um, all of those could be considered forms of direct democracy. The best known one is referenda, direct votes of the people, yes or no, on all kinds of questions. Let me ask you a personal question. <clears throat> you are generally recognized uh, as, as one of the top three uh, experts in this area. Uh, and it, there's no ranking among the three, but you're just one of the top three, and we were so pleased we could uh, snatch you here for the, for the show. But how did you, a man of many interests, how did you get involved in, uh, in direct democracy work? Uh, really, very straightforward. I was working in Washington, D.C. at uh, the Free Congress Foundation with Paul Weyrich, uh, one of the leading thinkers, if you will, of, on the conservative side of the spectrum in America. But Paul's background, was in journalism. Uh, he actually had worked with Roger Mudd, for example, both of them when they were young men. And Paul thought it was very important that there be a regular monitor in the early 1980s, that there be a regular monitor of direct democracy and that it be objective, that it be old-fashioned journalism. I had begun working for him. He asked me to do that and that's what I wound up doing along with some other duties for 10 years I did a regular uh, political newsletter that covered the politics of direct democracy. I had people all over the country write for me, um, uh, right, left, and center. I had, and the newsletter became a trusted source of information, even though most folks that I worked with certainly knew my uh, conservative leanings. When I came to these issues, I really tried to concentrate on being, doing good political science, good journalism in the high classical tradition. Uh, of American politics, and I think we succeeded, and that's how that niche you described earlier got carved out in slow motion. It was just a practical, I responded to a request from the guy I worked for, and the rest is history. You found it interesting, I take it. Oh, it's fascinating. Yeah. And there really was, and still is, only a few people uh, that pay regular attention to it. My expertise um, uh, remains, but my intensive work on it was that decade of the 90s of the 80s, and then I continue to read the works of friends like Tom and others. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned the different kinds of direct democracy that are happening around the United States. How does Oklahoma compare in terms of what's happening in other places? We're certainly not the most uh, active of the direct democracy states. Um, we would probably fall somewhere in the upper one-third, and I, th some of those numbers are a little impressionistic. You know, you have some years uh, for example, back in the early 90s, there was a wave of major decisions uh, made in Oklahoma and in the 80s also, uh, uh, liquor by the drink uh, came about as a result of uh, a direct vote of the people. One of the things to understand is that Oklahoma is an initiative state, which means that substantive policy issues can come to the ballot as a result of citizen petitioning and a subsequent vote. But all of the states, except Delaware, actually require that any constitutional amendment, whether originated by an initiative, as you can in Oklahoma, or through legislative referral, which is by far more common, all of the states but Delaware require popular approval 
of constitutional amendments. So even your non-initiative states, like New York, you get some really important questions. Sometimes they're a little arcane, but important questions decided on directly by the people. Let me ask you a little different question uh, on the issue of recall. We are all familiar with the recall election in California of Gray Davis and the subsequent election of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger as governor there. Mm -hmm. uh, I have taken a brief look and didn't find any Oklahoma statewide recall statutes where we could recall a governor or a lieutenant governor if we chose to. I'm not talking about impeachment. Right. I'm talking about recall. You know, you are asking a question I didn't have a chance to go check. I do not think we have it statewide. It does exist. Um, in some of the local jurisdictions. That's what's, a question of home rule. Yeah, what's your take on recall? Is that is that something that's a good power to be vested in the people or something that ought to be left for the next election cycle? What's your personal view about that? Uh, my personal view is uh, it's probably a good safety valve to have. Um, when I did work at the Oklahoman and actually you know took a, a point of view on issues, um, I often was asked to advocate the defeat of a, of a member of the judiciary, and I don't think we ever did that. Uh, both myself and uh, the late Mr. Gaylord, Edward L. Gaylord, were very reluctant, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't exist. Uh, I wasn't in California at the time of the Gray Davis situation, uh, nor the earlier uh, equally contentious uh, recall of Rose Byrd, uh, mm -hmm. who was a member of the state Supreme Court, very liberal. Uh, member of the court. In that case, I probably would have been for uh, the recall, but even given some liberal members of the Oklahoma judiciary, Mr. Gaylord and I agreed that we did not support uh, a no vote when the time came for their uh, uh, to be reconsidered for whether or not they would stay on the bench. Now, that's a different question than recall, yes. but I'm answering it that way that I think the power probably should be there and should be used very judiciously, much like the citizen power of um, calling a grand jury. I think that should be used with the utmost care and there should be a great deal of scrutiny and attention paid whenever anybody is with one of those petitions in the field. Let me jump in there and get us to a break. Uh, we're visiting with uh, Patrick McGuigan, Deputy Commissioner of Labor, but a real expert in direct democracy. We'll be right back. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record, since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. We'll see Meyer Eatman Tate. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma, working with the owners of small and medium-sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. We'll see Meyer Eatman Tate in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. That land next door was a mess. Take more than a lawnmower to revive that land. I heard the oil and natural gas people was cleaning up old oil sites and it wouldn't cost us a flood nickel. Oh yes sir, it was quite a revival. The whole church showed up Want to make a playground for the kid. <laughs> it sure is a blessing. <laughs> All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all the quality, assistance, and representation that can be offered in our legal system. For more information, call 23CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. Stuck in a rut? Move your career onto the fast track in one of the most exciting segments of the high-tech industry. The Cox Communications National Wireless Call Center for Excellence is hiring employees in Oklahoma City to specialize in wireless customer care. 
management opportunities are available for people with substantial experience in the wireless industry. If you're ready to take your career to the next level, submit your resume online at www.cox.com and become a part of the Cox tradition of excellence. Hi, honey. You've got to check this out. What? What are we listening to? I had digital phone service installed today. It sounds just like before. I know, but it's going to save us a ton of money. With Cox Digital Telephone, you'll save big every month. Keep your same phone number and get your favorite calling features. Just pay less. That does sound good. You should hear the upstairs phone. Welcome back to The Verdict. Kent Myers and Robert Campbell. Campbell. We are visiting with Patrick McGuigan on the subject of direct democracy. Pat, uh, let me ask you, what are the principal reasons that the initiative is used instead of just running these issues through the elected representatives and let them vote on them? It's a very interesting question, and it's kind of the flip side of why, why do courts sometimes wind up resolving tough questions? And that is, um, in some cases, avoidance of tough issues and tough calls by elected representatives. Too and hot to handle. Huh? Too hot to handle and issues that the people are simply insisting there be a resolution of, either in the political process or uh, in litigation in the courts. People are looking for answers. And um, it's a process that you can make the case is sometimes overused in states perhaps like California and Oregon but it's a safety valve. Um, it has functioned, I believe, in Oklahoma pretty much as the populous founders of the state intended. It's a way to force a f determination on issues that are important that might not otherwise get resolved. It also, here's the flip side, all that contentiousness aside, validity. Uh, ultimately, a vote of the people even if pieces of it are subject to judicial review. A vote of the people, much like the ratification of the constitutional amendments of the Bill of Rights at the founding of the country, have a kind of ultimate validity. They're, they're regarded as just because the people touched the issue. What type of issues tend to come up in direct democracy in initiatives as, as opposed to coming up at the legislature? Well, when I, when I was doing this every day 20 years ago, the question uh, would have had a much different answer than it has today. Today you're seeing issues like uh, uh, traditional marriage versus civil unions uh, as a recurring theme in the last three or four years in American politics, indirect votes of the people. In the 1980s, early 1980s, the nuclear weapons freeze, something we don't even talk about anymore, which succeeded but failed, didn't change national policy, and yet it became very clear in Reagan's memoirs and in notes and in internal memos, it was very clear, was having a very substantial effect on Reagan's thinking as he approached meetings uh, with uh, Gorbachev and leaders of other countries. Uh, so here was an international policy, national policy defense issue being considered by the people. 70s and 80s, 90s, right up till now, a recurring theme has been tax-related issues, tax and spending related. Uh, many uh, people listening will remember the Howard Jarvis, the late Howard Jarvis, a great tax cut leader uh, in the state of California. He had his equivalents in Oregon and in several other states. Uh, so on the conservative side, tax and spending is a recurring issue, and then these other contentious issues more recently. If there's any way to generalize it, <clears throat> how do these issues that ultimately reach a vote generally turn out? Uh, do, are they generally successful or generally voted down? Historically, over time, more than two-thirds of measures that come to the people through the legislative process that are placed there by legislators, 65 to 70 percent of those over time prevail. Flip side, measures coming to the ballot as a result of citizen petitioning over time, about two-thirds of them uh, are defeated and one-third prevail. They do tend to be more cutting edge, although sometimes the issues that come, uh, like the right to work referendum in Oklahoma, that come through the legislative process can be every bit as contentious as an initiative. And once they get there, a major issue, campaigns for and against are much like they are uh, around an initiative. Yeah. 
So two thirds, one third, easy to remember. Yeah. And in Oklahoma, it can come out of the legislature or be initiated directly by signatures? Yeah, of course. Yeah, the constitutional amendments can come to the people in Oklahoma through the citizen initiative process. That's not the case in every state. As you've watched the trends around the United States, what kind of trends are you seeing in direct democracy? You see it's increasing, it's decreasing. What, what are you seeing? I think the major trend I'm seeing is over about the last 25 years, uh, there has been greater resort to citizen petitioning than, say, 50 years ago to get measures to the ballot. There's also more judicial review pre-election and in yeah. the petition process uh, than there was uh, in an earlier era. So on the one hand, a greater volume of petitioning. On the other hand, uh, the courts paying greater scrutiny at the front end. What are the, uh, <clears throat> what you might characterize as drawbacks to direct democracy or bad things about direct democracy, if anything? Let me answer by starting the primary good thing yeah. I see is that validity I referred to earlier, that if the people touch it, it has a certain justness and validity to it. Um, it's a statement of confidence in ourselves to allow this process. Now then, the drawbacks. The drawbacks are really the same. This is a political science kind of answer. They're the same as they are for our entire system. When courts intervene in areas that arguably they should stay out of, maybe you put in doubt the validity of the role of the courts. But we need review. Uh, we've needed review since the beginning of the country. Switching over to the legislative process, we all know uh, it's the, the proverbial stories about watching sausage get made. Uh, it's sort of the equivalent of watching the legislative process. That has a lot of drawbacks. There's a lot of excesses, a whole lot of money uh, that's brought to bear by contending sides. and. The resort to indirect democracy, as in candidate elections, sound bites, very short, direct, you know, 30 second and 15 second advertising today compared to when I was a young man, one minute. One minute ads, much more common. Uh, that tends to airbrush away some of the subtleties sometimes. That's a downside in the politics of direct democracy. It's why the courts have, uh, it's why legislative bodies and the people themselves have passed measures saying an initiative should deal with only a single subject. That's one of the ways the system corrects itself and one of the things that's caused uh, pre-election judicial review sometimes. Get it down to a single question, then the people can clearly see a yes or a no. In Oklahoma or elsewhere, <clears throat> there's some thought or criticism that it's simply gotten too expensive to exercise your direct democracy rights from the standpoint of uh, the very short period of time that a petitioner has to gather the, relevant, the requisite number of signatures. It takes an enormous financial effort to get that done. Uh, and then uh, by the same token, you may have a very short time to get your message out either for or against the issue that requires a great deal of money. Do you think I'll that give, uh, Yeah, I'll give the same idealistic answer. Uh, in this case, I've not, my thinking hasn't evolved a lot over the last 25 years. It's about the same as it was uh, in the early 1980s, and that is compared to what? Yeah. Uh, Newt Gingrich often used to give the answer, and uh, there's even a few of the liberal uh, uh, analysts and leaders that have said the same kind of thing. Compared to what? It's expensive compared to, you take almost any area of American endeavor, and the total that we spend for and against issues, for and against candidates, mm -hmm. is dwarfed by what we spend in many other areas of our life. As long as there's disclosure, as long as people know who is spending for and against a cause or uh, candidates, um, I'm a, sort of like George Will. The more the merrier. Let's have robust, vigorous speech. And right. as long as we know where the money's coming from, we can decide what that means, and that helps us make decisions. Pat, excuse me for interrupting. We're out of time. Thank you so much for your thoughtful answers. Uh, Robert and I appreciate your uh, being with us. You're watching The Verdict. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa. 
where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. I know you guys said I'd save with Cox Digital Telephone. Well, my bill came and... Could this be right? You may be surprised how much you save with Cox Digital Telephone. That's why over a million and a half people have switched. So this really is a total. Lovely. Because I think I found a good use for the savings. With Cox, there's no waiting for the other shoe to drop. The only surprise is there's no surprise at all. <laughs> Just keep it. Thank you. Dr. Kessler? What's up with the pizzas? Well, I just got my first satellite bill, and those extra fees were a bit of a shocker. So I had to take a second job. Hey, this was supposed to be pepperoni, Dillweed. Hey, it's Dr. Dillweed to you. Whatever. Kids. <laughs> it's cool, eh? You know, I'm a people person. Don't live in satellite denial. Get all your entertainment without the hidden charges from Cox, your friend in the digital age. Verdict with Robert McCampbell and Kent Myers. Uh, good show today. It was a good show today. It was interesting to hear Pat talk about how we bridged the gap from the, the town hall meetings of, you know, colonial America up to today with modern campaigns and modern sound bites and modern techniques. And, and always in front of us. Uh, in Oklahoma, we're particularly uh, blessed that way. I uh, want to remind the viewers to uh, go to our website, theverdict.tv, and let us know what you'd like to see. If you want to see some more on direct democracy, we'll do it. Uh, for uh, Robert McCampbell, this is Kent Myers. We'll see you next week. The preceding program was produced by the Production Services Group at Cox Communications, exclusively for the Cox Channel.